Welcome. In this lecture, we are going to study a stronger version of the weak maximum principle that we considered in the last lectures. It is called strong maximum principle. We will also be discussing what is known as Dirichlet principle. Dirichlet principle roughly speaking, it says that solving a Dirichlet boundary value problem is same as solving a minimization problem for a functional. Let us get into the lecture. The outline is consisting of two points, strong maximum principle and then we move on to discuss Dirichlet principle. So, let omega be a bounded domain in R2 and u be a harmonic function in omega. The weak maximum principle asserted that the maximum value of u on omega closure is attained on the boundary of omega. Of course, it never told where else the maximum is attained in particular whether maximum is attained in the domain omega or not, it did not say. Strong maximum principle that we are going to prove says that if such a maximum is also attained inside omega, then the harmonic function must be a constant function. So, let us state strong maximum principle as a theorem. Let omega inside R2 be a domain, domain need not be bounded. Let u from omega to R be a harmonic function. If u attains its maximum in omega, then u is constant. Notice in the hypothesis of strong maximum principle, we are not assuming that omega is a bounded domain. Therefore, even if you have a continuous function which is even continuous on the closure of omega, the maximum or minimum may not make sense. Therefore, strong maximum principle does not talk about that. On the other hand, what does it talk about is if there is a maximum and that maximum is attained in omega, then the harmonic function has to be a constant function. That is what the strong maximum principle asserts. So, what is the idea of the proof? Assume that u attains the maximum value denoted by m. In other words, there is a hidden assumption in the background that is supremum is indeed meaningful and that supremum is attained at some point in omega. That when it is attained, the supremum is called maximum and let us denote it by capital M at some point P naught in omega. So, P naught is a point in omega where u attains the maximum value namely the m. Let P be any other point okay, in omega. We will show that u of P equal to m. So, what does that mean? u of p equal to m for every p in omega. That means u is a constant function. How do we show this? Step 1, u is locally constant near points of the maximum. So we are assuming that the maximum is attained at p0. Therefore, what is the meaning of this sentence? u is locally constant near points of maximum. There is a disk around p0 on which u is constant and that constant is m. Step 2, continuation argument. We have shown in step 1 that u is constant in a disk around P0, but I want to show that u of P is also m. So, the natural idea is to go from P0 to P using a curve and show all along the curve u is the constant m. Then it follows that u of P equal to m. We will see how this idea is implemented in the step 2. So, connect P0 and P by a curve, try to continue the idea in step 1 from P0 till P. So, let us move to step 1. We are going to show that u is locally constant near points of maximum. I already mentioned how we should read this kind of words locally. So, this u is locally constant near points of maximum. It means take any point of maximum then there is a disk around that on which u is constant. That is the meaning of locally constant. So, let u of p0 be m as we assumed, where m is the maximum of u over omega. Let r be such that the closed disk d p0, r is contained in omega. Recall this notation, 
we use this closed brackets here, these brackets, square brackets to denote the closed balls or closed discs. If there is a point Q in this disc P0, R where U is not M. In other words, if U is not M, M being the maximum, U will be strictly less than M. So, suppose this happens. Then by continuity of U, there is a disk around Q, a closed disk around Q on which the function remains less than M. This follows by continuity. So, in view of the mu valley property, we know that M is given by U of P0. Now, U of P0 is given an average or the mean over this disk D of P0, comma R this is the area of the disk pi r square integral of u over the disk divided by the area of the disk. So, therefore, this is the average on the disk that is equal to u of p 0 we know this because of the mean value property. So, we have stated this already on the last slide. Now, we write d of p 0 comma r as union of two things, one is d p 0 r minus d q epsilon union d q epsilon. Therefore, the integral becomes sum of these two integrals. Now, I know that on this it is strictly less than m, u is strictly less than m, on this u is less than or equal to m. Therefore, we have a strict less than now because the first term is strictly less than and this is a non-zero quantity. So, if you multiply with a non-zero non-zero non-negative quantity with a strict inequality, strict inequality is respected. So, we have strict inequality here, I have replaced u with the bound for u which is strictly less than m on the disk and u is less than or equal to m anyway in omega. Now, if you see these two integrals add up to an integral on dp 0 r. Therefore, this evaluates to m because m is a constant it comes out what you have is integral of d p 0 r which will give you the area and anyway you have a area here. So, both get cancelled and you get m. So, what we have got is m less than m it is not possible. We conclude that u is constant on the disk d p 0 r. Why did we get this uh, contradiction of m less than m? That is because we assume that there is a point q at which u is strictly less than m that is the reason why we got m less than m here. Okay. A given any real number uh, it has to be equal to itself it cannot be strictly less than or strictly greater than because of the law of trichotomy in real numbers. So, this concludes the proof of step 1 where we have established that there is a r such that u is constant on disk of radius r with center at p0. Let us move on to the step 2 the continuation argument. Assume P0 is a point of maximum let m be equal to u of P0. We are going to prove that u is a constant function that takes the value m everywhere in omega. So, take a arbitrary point P in omega we will show that u of P equal to m. So, let gamma be a smooth curve without self intersections we these kind of things we need for the technical things that will follow. Otherwise simply speaking take a curve which connects P and P0. Existence of such a curve essentially follows from the path connectedness of omega which in turn follows from omega being open and connected. So, once you have a curve you can always have a smooth curve. So, take it as a fact or try to do the exercise if you have enough background try to do this as an exercise. So, since gamma is a compact set it maintains a positive distance from boundary of omega when omega is a proper subset of R2. So, let us denote this distance by d gamma. If omega is Rd then take d gamma to be any positive real number. So, in other words we have P0 here we take any point P and take a curve gamma. Now, if the this is imagine this is a bounded domain omega 
our domain is omega is like this it has boundaries then what is the distance of this curve to this boundary of omega that is a positive number. So, we have to see which is the closest point perhaps this is the closest point in this picture or maybe this. So, if you call d gamma as a distance what, what does that would mean is that if you take at any point on this curve take a circle of radius strictly less than d gamma it will not intersect the boundary of omega that is the reason why we are taking this. In other words this ball of radius which is strictly less than d gamma is properly contained in omega. Of course, if omega is r d you can take any d gamma you do not have to be careful at all. So, in e either of these two situations the disc of radius d gamma by 2 which is strictly less than d gamma with center at p 0 denoted by d p 0 d gamma by 2 lies in omega. Not only this even the close disc d close bracket p 0 d gamma by 2 close bracket that also lies in omega. So, by step 1 we know that u is constant on this disc because p 0 is a point of maximum therefore, u is locally constant we proved in step 1 therefore, u is identically equal to m on this ball on this disc. Actually step 1 says that u is locally constant around points of maximum of u. But if you carefully observe step 1 what we have actually proved is that whenever you find a disc with center at p0 where p0 is a point of maximum of u such that the closed disc is contained in omega then u is identically equal to m on this disc. Now, for a point q in gamma let d p 0 q denote the distance from p naught to q along the curve gamma. So, let me just illustrate suppose you have point p naught p here and you take any point q ok. The usual distance is the Euclidean distance which is the length of this line, but what I am asking you to do is take the length along this curve along this curve. You know that if you move along curves and not along straight line the distance will be more. So, go along this that distance is called d of p 0 comma q. So, we now take a point p 1 on gamma which lies in this disc p 0 d gamma by 2 that means, so this is p 0 this is p and by step 1 we have proved that on this disc whose radius is d gamma by 2 u is constant. Now, we plan to take a point p 1 which is on this curve lies in this disc, but where will we take? Will we take here? Will we take here? Let us see more prescription. We are going to take on this curve I want p 1 to be on the curve gamma also. So, I will take p 1 inside this here this is my p 1. So, p 1 is inside this ball p 1 is here. Not only that I want to maintain some distance d of p 0 comma p 1 I will take it to be d gamma by 4. Recall what is this d p 0 p 1 it is a distance along the curve d gamma by 4 therefore, p 1 will lie inside because along a curve I am taking a smaller distance d gamma by 4 whereas, the disc is d gamma by 2. So, this point p 1 cannot be outside if a p 1 satisfies this criterion that the distance along the curve is d gamma by 4 it is not outside this disc therefore, it will be inside. So, it is possible to find such a p 1 which is in this disc as well as this criterion. I have already explained why is it possible to find such a point and u of p 1 equal to m because p 1 is in the disc p 0 d gamma by 2 therefore, u of p 1 is m. Now, repeating the above argument get points p 2, p 3 and so on till you get a k in n such that p belongs to the disc 
with center p k and radius d gamma by 2. So, in each of these steps when we try to find p 2, p 3 etcetera we are insisting on this that p l of course belongs to the previous one p l minus 1 radius t gamma by 2 we are not compromising on the radius it is always the same and importantly the distance between the center and the point we are choosing is d gamma by 4 the distance is fixed that means we are definitely moving along this curve okay p1 is here so this distance along the curve is d gamma by 4 and it is here so these two distances are same see sometimes it may happen that you are moving from some point to the another point in the step 1 let us say x0, x1, x2 but then you may be you may be never crossing this some point x star ok. It can happen that the steps are becoming smaller and smaller and you are getting accumulated somewhere you are not crossing this x star. But every time if you move a fixed step like this you will definitely exhaust the distance which you need to do is simply d of p0, comma p that is the distance if you cross using these tiny steps d gamma by 4 how many number of times that that is the thing really here. So, L is equal to 1 to k perhaps yeah then definitely will exceed this. So, somewhere before the p will fall into one of these disks this is extremely important. We will then have u of p equal to m because u at p k is m and u is constant on this disk therefore, at any point in this in particular at p which is in this disk u will be m. This finishes the proof of the theorem. Another proof let us look at define a sec s by set of all x in omega such that u x equal to m. S is a non empty subset of omega because we are assuming that u takes the value m what is m? m is that maximum value of u. Uh, u takes the value m at some point in omega that is assumption therefore, the set is non empty and it is a closed subset of omega because u is a C2 function in particular continuous function continuous function equaling a constant will be a closed set. You can also think like this this is a continuous function constant function is also continuous. So, two functions are continuous that set where they are equal is a closed set or you can also look at ux minus m equal to 0 and set of all x where a continuous function takes the value 0 is a closed set. Now, it is an open subset of omega it is not clear just from this definition using continuity you can only prove it is closed. We have to use something extra that we know about u namely u is harmonic. Open set is exactly the step 1 in our proof where we have proved that if u takes the maximum value at some point then there is a disk around that point where u takes constant value m that is precisely the meaning of showing this set is open set. So, we have got a set which is non empty open and closed it is a subset of omega what is omega it is a open and connected set. There you have a subset which is non empty and both open and closed by connectedness of omega such set has to be the full set that is s equal to omega this is another proof. Because we are using here omega is connected the proof looks so simple because we are using the fact that if you are working in a connected set or a connected topological space a subset which is both open and closed has to have only two choices either it is empty set or the whole set. We are using that result here that is why it is simple and step 1 proof anyway we have to supply here. So, essentially step 2 is removed and we are appealing to the connectedness. Of course, we have used the connectedness in another format in, a, in the other proof also. A remark on the proof of strong maximum principle both the proofs use the mean value property of u namely in step 1 mean value property is an exclusive property of harmonic functions. Recall we have not only shown that every harmonic function has mean value property, but also every continuous function which has mean value property is harmonic. 
So, almost mean value property is exclusively a property for the harmonic functions. Harmonic functions means solutions of Laplace in u equal to 0. But strong maximum principle holds for a larger class of elliptic operators for which mean value property may not hold because general elliptic operator need not be just Laplacian all the time. So, there are operators which are more general than Laplacian for which also the strong maximum principle holds. And the proof uses what is known as Hopf's lemma, Hopf, lemma of Hopf. Most of the text dealing with general elliptic operators have the necessary details, you may cancel them if you are interested. But in this course, we will not go beyond Laplace equation as I have pointed out at the beginning. Strong maximum principle asserts that if a harmonic function attains its maximum in a domain omega, bounded or otherwise, then it is necessarily a constant function. Note that strong maximum principle does not comment on existence of a maximum value for harmonic functions, does not comment about location at which supremum is attained if it exists. Let us look at an example, let omega be the domain exterior to the unit disk. It means my domain is R2 minus the unit disk that is if is origin radius 1 my omega is this. This function u x y equal log s square plus y square is a harmonic function on omega. This can be easily checked u has neither a maximum value nor a minimum value in omega. Let us look at uh, Dirichlet principle. Before that let us recall some facts about system of linear equations. So, let A be symmetric positive definite matrix, let small b be a vector in R d then the following statements are equivalent. x belongs to R d is a solution to the linear system A x equal to b that is same as saying x is the minimizer of this functional g of y half y transpose a y minus y transpose b. Dirichlet principle is an analogous result in the context of Dirichlet boundary value problems. This is a very useful idea demonstrating its utility is beyond the scope of this course. Nevertheless, let me mention a couple of points. We have many methods to solve the system of linear equations A x equal to b. For example, we have what is known as uh, direct methods which will give us exact solutions like uh, Gaussian elimination method and some modifications of that. Exact methods are good, but when this A is a big size matrix, matrix of big size that is D is very big, then it is not profitable. In fact, a lot of errors might uh, get enhanced in the method of solution. And people have found that conjugate gradient method is one of the very useful methods which is based on minimizing this functional. So, Dirichlet principle is analogous to this result and if you understand the utility of this result, it is easier to understand how this will also be useful. In fact, these kind of ideas are used in establishing solutions to elliptic equations and that method is also called a calculus of variations and uh, the method itself is called uh, the first method is called the direct principle of calculus of variations where they will look at a minimizing sequence that is a sequence for example in this context sequence of vector y n such that j of y n converges to infimum of this functional and show that y n converges to some y and j of y is actually the minimum of the functional. So, that is the general idea in the direct method in calculus of variations. Okay, what is Dirichlet principle? Let omega be a bounded domain in R2 with smooth boundary. Let f be continuous on omega bar, g belongs to c of boundary of omega and u is c2 of omega bar. Then the following statements are equivalent. The function u is a solution to the Dirichlet boundary value problem minus Laplace in u equal to f in omega and u equal to g on the boundary of omega. 
and that is same as saying u is a minimizer of the functional j defined by this formula below and defined for v which is in C2 omega bar such that v equal to g on boundary of omega. So, minimizer in this set because if u is a solution to the Dirichlet boundary well problem u is in this set u equal g on boundary of omega u is C2 of omega bar by our assumption. So, for a C2 omega bar function these two statements are equivalent. If you know that u is a solution to the Dirichlet boundary well problem you can prove that it is a minimizer of this functional and so conversely if u is a minimizer of this functional then it actually solves the Dirichlet boundary well problem. So, let us denote this set by S. Yes. So, let us move to proof of 1 implies 2. Let u be a solution to the Dirichlet BVP and let v be an element of S. Yes. Multiply the equation minus Laplace in u equal to f with u minus v and then integrate on omega which we by this we get this. Then integrate by parts on the LHS that means the Laplace in u becomes grade u and you will get a gradient here which is here gradient of u minus v is grad u minus grad v. No boundary terms from integration by parts because u equal to v on the boundary. So, rearranging the terms in this equation we get this. So, bring this term to this side take this term here to that side. Now look at this inequality integral grad u dot grad v is less than or equal to integral norm grad u into norm grad v simply because a dot b is less than or equal to norm a into norm b this is a Euclidean norm okay, of a vector. So, it is grad u of x grad v of x is less than or equal to norm grad u of x into norm grad v of x. Now here this integral is less than or equal to this integral after that this is called the first term as a second term as b is this is a into b okay that is less than or equal to a square plus b square by 2 i have used that so we get this so using the inequalities on the last slide we get that integral over omega of norm grad u of x square dx minus integral over omega of f u is less than or equal to this minus integral over omega of f v. So, rearranging the terms we get this all the terms featuring u on one side and v on the other side, but what is this? This is nothing but j u is less than or equal to j v this is the definition of j u this is the definition of j v. Thus u is a minimizer of the functional j over the set s. Yes. This completes the proof of 1 implies 2. Let us look at proof of 2 implies 1. So, let v be a C0 infinity function defined on omega and t be a real number. Then we have j of u plus t v you plug into the formula of j you get this expression. And rewriting this what we get is j of u plus t v minus j of u take it this to the left hand side uh, this remains as it is RHS. So, since the functional j achieves its minimum at u that is the hypothesis in 2 the function h from r to r defined by h of t equal to j of u plus t v minus j of u that achieves minimum at t equal to 0 thus h prime of 0 is 0 which will give us this relation integrating by parts on the LHS will give us minus Laplacian into V. So, integral minus Laplacian u into V equal to integral f V and this is true for every V which is C0 infinity of omega. Therefore, minus Laplacian u of x equal to f of x. Note that u satisfies the boundary condition as u belongs to the set S. The set S in the definition itself includes that u equal to g on the boundary of omega. So, here we need not work with C0 infinity of omega we can as well work with C02 of omega 
that is C2 functions with compact support in omega. If this equality holds for every V which is C2 0 of omega, then you have that minus Laplacian V equal to F holds at every point of omega. So, this proves that U is a solution to the BVP, thus completing the proof of 2 implies 1. So, let us summarize what is done in this lecture. We have proved a strong maximum principle and we have established the equivalence of Dirichlet boundary value problem and a minimization problem. Thank you.